I love the movie. Uh, is it fair to say that, that Danson, which is no, no stranger, that work, and it's brought so many joyous moments to people in Boston, twice around, is it yes. fair to say that that's your life's work in terms of choreography, and that perhaps this movie is maybe a life's work in terms of being a man? Is that a fair comparison? Well, it's kind of nice that you say that, but I, I think I have more dancing to do. I hope so, and I think I have more life to live. But, but this movie, were you going for something? Obviously, all through it, it deals with your heart attack. It deals with your great moments in terms of choreography. And it deals with your, your, the women in your life. But is it kind of an immortality kind of thing to you? Well, I tell you, I think anybody who makes movies, and, uh, and this is going to sound a little strange, but I think there is a reach to live a little longer after you die. You know, it's like leaving something behind that people can always remember you by. So I think people who make movies or write books or anything like that, there is a stretch for immortality, yes. Uh, I, I made all that jazz because I thought it would be a good show, the same way I made dancing. You know, if, if it says something else about the people who made it or, or about any other subject that's in all that jazz, and there's a lot of things in it, I'm happy for that. But basically, my desire was to entertain people. Oh, and you did. You did so well. I, I, could money have stopped you or a lack of money have oh. stopped you? Always. <laughs> there was That's a story. So I mean, the studios were saying to you, hey, Bob, don't shoot the end. You're out of budget. Mm -hmm. Let's wait and see. And, yes. and Alan Ladd Jr. was the one that said, That's correct. come on and we'll yes. do it. That's How did that make you feel? Wasn't that frustrating? Well, it was interesting because um, they were going to pull the rug. And I must say, that was Columbia. But I understood their side. I was over budget. Uh, their point of view was put the film together, and if you need to go back and fill in what you don't have, we will do that. But I know that it would be over then, because Roy Scheider would be off somewhere, Jessica Lange would be somewhere, and Ann Ranking would be off in a show somewhere. So I knew that we'd never get back together. What was interesting, though, was that Roy Scheider knew this fully five days before I knew it, that that following Friday, the paychecks were going to stop, and mm. he never told me. He got on the phone to California, and he tried to hustle up some money himself, he got Sam Cohen, who represents both of us, and Danny Melnick, and they took the film out there like Willie Loman, a couple cans of film, <laughs> <laughs> and, and trudged around to the various studios, and, and um, Laddie, Alan Ladd Jr., said, yeah, I'm in for half of that. I like it. So a lot of people believed in what you were doing. Enough to get it on, yeah. What about your relationship with Roy? I mean, after all, he plays you in the film. Have you been friends for a long time? Well, it's, you know, I, I get to that point, it's, it's not really me. It's a character that resembles me, but it is, it is different in a lot of ways. But back to Roy, uh, I think it's one of the best relationships I ever had with an actor. He Why? What I, makes well, it good? i tell you one thing. I, first of all, I think he's a good actor and all the things you need. But the reason I liked Roy so much, he was not fat. And I don't mean literally fat. I mean, he was not blown over with success. Mm. He was hungry. He said, this is a part, it's a kind of part they never give me. Uh, they always give this to the other guys. And he said, I want this part. I believe in this movie. I like this guy. I can play him. I can be light. I can be charming. I don't always have to play a cop or, or a sheriff of a small town. He said, so he said, let me do it, please. And, and I auditioned him, and he was all the things he, he claimed he could be. And he worked that way. He was relentless about learning to dance and, and all the things that a choreographer and director goes through. So I really enjoyed working with Roy, and I think he, it shows. I think he's terrific. Yeah. You, have a, you have this incredible uh, desire for perfection that comes through on the stage. It came through in the film. Where does that come from? I don't know. I just uh, um, I can't stand mediocrity when I go to the theater myself, or sloppiness in any way. I think I have a dreadful fear within myself that there's a great streak of mediocrity in me and a great streak of laziness. Well, I've read you are your own worst critic. Yeah. I think probably, no, I've read some that are worse. <laughs> 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 anyway, I'm so afraid that this, this sense that I have in myself, this uh, indolent streak that I have, will take over, that I work twice as hard and I try to make things as good, you know. I mean, I used to rehearse all night long because I thought, ah, every other director and choreographer is sleeping. Uh. So I'm getting <laughs> <laughs> But you do that, don't yeah. you? And that came through to me in all that jazz. I mean, I got this sense that this Bob Fosse, he doesn't only create when he's, uh, when he's awake, he creates when he's asleep as well. Do you do that? A little bit, yeah. I find most of the ideas you have when you're dreaming are not very good. I mean, you dream these brilliant dances, you know, that just are absolute beauty or hilariously funny, and you get up in the morning and then you try to put them in execution, usually they're terrible. But uh, what I do do is 
when I find my mind working like that and, and full of ideas of one kind or another, I get up and I go to a studio and I like working and I, it's very quiet. Mm -hmm. It's the only time New York is quiet is in the middle of the night. You, uh, you're, you're second wife, <laughs> yes. McCracken, yes. Anne McCracken, Joan McCracken. Joan. Uh, it's kind of a, I don't know how, quite how to put this. You look at women kind of like a Pygmalion kind of thing. You know, you... Well, that was not the case there. It wasn't, was it? It was no. kind of the reversal. Much, much more. I mean, you didn't, you didn't have a college education, no, and you'd never even had a dance lesson before you started performing in this town, in New York City. No, I, I started in Chicago when I was nine. I, I, stu I studied dancing a long time, but... But she did something unusual for you, didn't she? She sure did. Uh, she was the biggest influence in my life and changed my life radically. She was about 12 years older than I. Although she never told me until very, she didn't? until after we were married. Did you have a sense of that though? That maybe she was almost a maternal kind Somebody of thing? else told me that on the outside and I went home and said, uh, are you really this much older? She, she said, they're a liar. That's not true <laughs> at all. How dare they, they're just jealous. And of course- But she when, brought some new things out uh, of that. She was one of, she made me stop. I, my ambition was to be a nightclub dance act, telling a few jokes, you know. I mean, that's as far as I wanted to think. And she just said, you've got to stop. You're better than that. You've got to go to school. So I went back, stopped performing, and got myself a bicycle in New York and pedaled around from class to class. I studied writing and diction and acting and singing and eight different kinds of dancing. And I benefited from that, that year more than anything else in the world. Plus, she was a very supportive woman, and she was a, a brilliant talent herself. Uh, Gwen Verdon was on our show not too long ago. Yeah. And I know that you're very it's close. <laughs> oh, great lady. I asked her, I said, what is it that you bring to the dancers, meaning Gwen, yeah. but what is it that Bob Fosse brings to these people? Your relationship with Liza Minnelli, from afar, I'm a singer, so from afar I have admired that, and I've always thought, why wasn't there a Bob Fosse in my life? But you really did such incredible things for her. I mean, you showcased her in an incredible way. I think that helped Liza, but Liza's pretty darn good on her own, you know. I mean, I don't think she needs that much help. I think I got her at the right time, which was for Cabaret, and, and she too was hungry. I mean, that's a feeling I just love about people who haven't quite made it, have all this talent and have had nowhere to put it. And I, I, I think my relationship with her was one of the most rewarding I've ever had. But yeah. I, I, she Why? didn't need that much help, I gotta tell you. Why? Is it because, because of something Because, oh, she has this enormous amount of talent that all you have to do is push a button or make a slight suggestion. She says, oh, I know, I know. Or she's overdoing something. And I think sometimes Liza tends to be over emotional. You just have to say, Liza, pull back a little. And it's just like some beautiful jewel of some kind or machine. She just knows how much to pull back. Mm. And so uh, the, the, the things that we've done together have been very successful. I sure have. She also did an amazing thing, you know, for me once a favor. Gwen was the star of Chicago, and Gwen got sick very short after, shortly after we opened. And it's always a problem when the star gets sick uh, when a show is just open. And so we were in trouble. I mean, we had Cheetah Rivera and Jerry Orbach, but they wanted somebody in that part. So Liza came and said, Bobby, if, if you want me, and she was very close with Candor and Ebb also. She said, if you want me to go in, and I'll, I'll go in until Gwen gets better, and I'll just jump I in. I remember that. It was an incredible uh, gesture. Why did you tell us that uh, when we look at all that jazz, we should remember that the last part of it is a rough cut? Well, that's Joe Gideon's uh, sense. That's the man who's the director at all times. Joe Gideon, that's the part Roy plays, is a man who just never stops directing, even when he's having an argument with somebody that's very important to him. If he hears a line of dialogue that he thinks that he may be able to use, he files that away. He's the total director. He even fantasizes his death as this elaborate concert. Is there any of that inside of you, Bob? Oh, yeah. Fantasizing oh, your death? Oh, sure. It's, it's kind of like you did it for us. You said, uh, I took charge of death and I did it. So don't bother coming when it happens. <laughs> well, if you're going to go, that's the way to go, I must say. <laughs> the other thing I have to ask you, in this movie, you have a heart attack. How does that, and you have a heart attack, and, well, Joe Gideon has a heart attack, mm -hmm. but you, in fact, had one in real life. Yes. How does that happen to somebody that is, obviously, you've stayed in great shape all of your life, you've taken care of yourself. Didn't that shock you? Well, I didn't take such great care of myself. You didn't? No, I sure didn't. I smoked too much and still smoke too much and dissipated a lot. I drank a lot and stayed out late and that sort of thing. All the things that you shouldn't do but are a lot of fun to do. <laughs> I did them. Are you taking care of yourself now? I'm trying. I hope so. So please don't we, lecture me. <laughs> I won't. We want you around for a long time. You I'd give like us such joy. <laughs> Thank you, Bob Fosse. Thank you, Ivy. We'll be back with